You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Now that we already understand race uh, and the racial segment, the second segment, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about gender and class. And so I want to talk about, you know, because race, class, and gender, they're all intertwined in helping us understand and appreciate something about the Chicano experience and the experiences of most human beings. But uh, I want to share with you all of my beans, and now I want to feminize them and then put them into their socioeconomic classes. So um, let's appreciate something uh, about gender. Okay, so if we can put gender down to the bottom thirds, and let's appreciate something about gender. Now, the first task uh, is, uh, to explain is what historians mean when we use the term gender. Now, historians, and by the way, I am a historian. I'm a Chicano historian, Native American historian. I'm a U.S. historian with a specialties in Native American Chicano history. So I'm a historian. So historians are concerned with gender as a form of power and with discourse, that is, with the production of particular kinds of knowledge about a subject through the use of language, images, spaces, and symbols. Okay? So, there are different definitions of the concept of gender, but most often they are explained in how symbols, norms, and institutions help to shape and to construct uh, male and female identities. In other words, how masculine and feminine subjects are made. So for man many, gender is a social representation of perceived biological differences. And used in this sense, gender can be um, seen to be defined in different ways and at different times and places. So gender has a history, and gender is central to historical investigation. Femininity and masculinity are socially constructed, and they are dependent and interdependent categories. But most importantly, as femininity and masculinity are constructed mutually, they form a pair, or they form a, 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 a binary. And this binary can be expressed in the form of femininity and masculinity. So such a dual construction can have negative consequences. Because first, it limits the possibility of alternative constructions of gender. And second, it makes the definitions of femininity and masculinity seem natural and not subject to change. Now, a classic example in the kinds of economies that we have lived in uh, uh, since uh, capitalism took over is the notion of women working outside the home for the first time as wage laborers. This occurred in Mexico and it occurred in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as journalists and newspaper reporters commented negatively on the increasing number of women working as wage laborers. In Mexico, they associated women working outside the home to women being able to grow hair on their chests. Now the public discourse in both countries was that such behavior was not only different from women's previous roles but that it seemed to go against nature itself. And then during World War II, what's going to happen is women entered the workforce in increasing numbers and taking on skilled work that was usually reserved for men. So since the, the post-war era, the Riveter experience challenged traditional perceptions of women as homemakers. Women now worked in men's occupations and wore men's clothing. So this dual or binary femininity and masculinity supports other binaries by making them appear as natural or illegitimate. So in the binaries, uh, pairs are always gendered feminine and they're gendered masculine. Now it is in this way that gender serves as a means of organizing ideas of equality and inequality and it becomes a crucial site or field where power is articulated. The relationship uh, among gender, power, and ideas about equality illustrates the most compelling reason for undertaking historical research through the lens of gender history, because everything is gendered. 
And in this way, gender is a useful category of historical analysis because it will allow us to understand alternatives to femininity and masculinity. So an analysis of the Chicano Chicana experience from the perspective of gender, might, uh, gender history might help us to understand the reasons women as well as men from different classes and regions are motivated to participate in a struggle to end the racialization process, in the struggle of resistance to end gendered specific experiences, in a struggle for civil rights, for women's rights, Okay, so when, for, for uh, uh, alternative forms of femininity and masculinity rights. So we're talking about LGBTQ uh, experiences. In other words, having a better understanding of official and popular ideas about masculinity and femininity is essential to explaining decisions that people, both men and women, made uh, both before and after the explosive civil rights movements, women's movements, Chicano movements, uh, uh, gay and lesbian movements that occurred in the 1960s. Okay? So the growing body of work concerned with the history of gender in uh, Chicano and Chicana literature suggests that the origins, the trajectory, and the outcome of this complex process of movements for change uh, are, are, are indeed shaped by considerations of gender. Okay, so we understand that everything is gendered, and so what's important to appreciate is that women, likewise, as, uh, uh, and, and those who are non-binary, um, are also experiencing a disadvantaged process. They also face the four-part process of discrimination, of educational deprivation, of economic marginality, and political disfranchisement. So when we take a look at gender, gender, the racialization process that I identified with the beans also applies to women's experiences, to those who are non-binary, of, of those who are, are lesbian, gay, queer, the, the, the queer nation. So it's important to appreciate that. And so when we take a look at women's experiences, it's very, very significant to an understanding of the Chicano experience. And this is where Graciela Limon's book, uh, uh, Song of the Hummingbird, uh, comes in to help us appreciate uh, this gendered experience. In fact, uh, when we uh, understand something about Graciela Limon, Graciela Limon, uh, in an interview, uh, she shared uh, with a, 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 a reporter that uh, she said that, I've often been asked, Graciela, how do you see yourself? What is the inspiration for your writing? And Graciela Limon responded that I see myself first as the daughter of Mexican immigrants, a Chicana, then as a writer and teacher. Having my roots in East Los Angeles has much to do with how I perceive myself. Being a first generation college graduate also molded me. The experience thrust me into the world of education, connecting me with many remarkable Marymount nuns and Jesuits. It's been their sense of social justice and service that put a lasting imprint on who I am, on what I write and teach. And that same world put me in touch with the Chicana and Latina students I've taught and mentored and who have become the inspiration for the female characters that inhabit the pages of my novels. They are now a part of me. These thoughts then take me deeper into my beginnings in East Los Angeles, where I was born, went to school, spoke Spanish, and learned English, where I lived and visited familia in old frame houses. All of it is me. It's what I write and teach. And so that is Graciela Limon. Now let's address, uh, that's gender. Now let's address class. And class is very important because it is about our position in the economy. Uh, class is significant because it identifies how we fit in to the larger society with regards to uh, the distinctions that we make about our consumption and about uh, the, the properties and the lands that we have. So class is very important because it includes land, uh, income, occupation, home, the neighborhood that you live, the prestige and the esteem that you have. And so there's many different kinds of distinctions that we have. There's social class distinctions, and those social class distinctions, of course, are about the, the types of, 
uh, of, of, uh, or the ways that you carry yourself out in public and the ways that you appear, uh, especially with regards to your hygiene, especially with regards to the neighborhood that you come from and, and how you uh, portray yourself in terms of uh, culture and traditions. Um, again, uh, the, the philosophy, the values, and the beliefs that you have, those are your social class distinctions. Then there's the economic class distinctions. And the economic class distinctions are very significant because many times we're always taking a look at people's economic class distinction. For instance, your house. How does your house look like? What neighborhood is it in? And then, of course, what kind of car are you driving? What shoes are you buying? Uh, what shoes are you wearing? What kind of glasses do you have? You know, are these uh, cheap glasses of, at, at, at Walmart for $15? Or are they Ray-Bans, you know? Uh, you know, your economic class distinctions. How do you carry? What kind of jewelry are you wearing? Oh my gosh, you have all of these things. Economic class distinctions are very important. And then there is the significance of class with regards to politics. Because... Your economic position also determines your political participation. Because if you're part of the elite class, then you're going to want to make sure that you have a politician that's helping you maintain your elite status. If you're in a working poor neighborhood, well, what the hell does politics care? What do you care about politics for you? You're busy struggling to survive. And so you don't have access to the political process that the rich have. Just take a look at our system today and understand how the billionaire class controlled this economy. So in terms of your class, likewise, you're also in a disadvantaged position. And in your disadvantaged position, that's the key to understanding uh, your, your experiences. Uh, uh, when you uh, look at uh, 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 the disadvantaged position, the four-part process in terms of your class, that also operates here. So what I'm trying to share with you is that not only race, but also gender and class are involved in this process because you're also if, uh, experiencing the disadvantaged position. The disadvantaged position, likewise, in terms of class, your economic marginality. That's the key uh, in terms of your class. Mm -hmm.